Oh, take him out. That's what you get. Oh, yes, that is what you get. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just switch to my two-handed now. Oh, yeah, take him out. No, 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 no. Hello, and welcome back to the Sturgeon Viking series. Now, as you can see right here, we're currently in a conversation on a trade screen with Yachana right here, and she has captured Servic, and I would like very much to transfer him into my care. And what we're also going to do is we're going to transfer a couple of my weapons as well, because as you can no doubt see, I am lugging around a huge number of of, well, basically every single kind of weapon. And I would like to be able to give her some stuff so that she can potentially sell this and gain some additional cash. And as we know, AI vassals do not care for the flippantry of the limited amount of funds that are in each particular marketplace. They just do not care one bit. So we are going to be giving her uh, probably like 200 or something along those lines. I mean, she's going to accept this no matter what. It doesn't actually matter about me, you know, giving her one or giving 200 or whatever the case may be. So we're just going to do this and hopefully she'll be able to sell a whole bunch of these for additional cash. That's exactly what I want to do at least. And I don't have to give her any money as a result of that. And it also helps me out a little bit too, because let's face it, I don't think I'm ever going to have enough charcoal to even be able to smelt all that stuff. I'm also never going to have enough, well, money in the marketplaces, as I mentioned, to be able to actually, like, you know, sell everything as well. Anyway, we were just in a battle with Chagan and Servic here, and we're going to be absolutely executing them. Absolutely executing them because they are terrible, terrible people. And, uh, oh, oh, look at that. Chagan was actually the ruler. Look at that. Fantastic. I had no idea that that was actually the case. Let me actually just have a look at him real quick. There he is. Yeah, he's absolutely done. Oh, look at this. Yes, this is... <laughs> I'm actually not entirely sure what has happened to the Kuzate because I actually haven't been doing too many executions. I basically took a couple of them prisoner. I placed them in the garrison, well, not in the garrison, in the dungeon of one of our castles behind us in uh, Sturgeon territory. And then I executed the ones that I knew of. And um, for some reason, I think they're dying in battles. I think that's the main thing. They are actually dying in battles quite a bit. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can go into the kingdom screen here. Where are the Kuzate? No, that's the wrong one. There's the Kuzate. Okay, so yeah, it seems like um, they do have a couple of uh, a couple of clans remaining. Now, I, I gotta mention, someone was um, very observant in the previous episode when I went to zoom out on the world map, and you pointed out that Maronath has actually changed sides. And I gotta say, I'm very disappointed, sorely disappointed by that, because Mr. Heckard was the person that I entrusted with that. He's been dead for a while, by the way, so it's actually not him that betrayed us. It's actually someone else. And it's Peric. Mr. Peric right there. He's the guy that uh, ended up uh, betraying the Sturgeons. And he is someone that will most certainly pay dearly with their head rolling across the ground. At least that is what we are going to try and accomplish. So we're just going to go in against Korajin right here. We're just going to go for a nice auto resolve. Very, very swift. Very, very easy. Usually what I'll do is if there's a very large battle, I'll do that manually, but most of these vassals, unless they're in an army, are going to be extremely simple for us to eliminate, and we will be taking her down because she is, as you can see, the last member of her clan, and uh, per the rules or the self-imposed rules that I decided on, we're going to be executing anyone that is the final member of their clan to finalize the... Uh, well, elimination of that particular entity in the game. So hopefully we are going to be able to take Van Novapol. There's only 335 here. I decided to come up here as well because, well, it's maybe about time that we try to do something against the Kuzate because they are quite strong. And uh, I'm actually kind of surprised to say that, to be honest, because their combat strength is leaving a lot to be desired right now. And I am very surprised that they are still putting up so much of a fight. As you can see, however, the Sturgeons really do not have any vassals whatsoever to spare. 
and as a result, I won't be able to ask for anyone's assistance myself. So we're going to have some issues here, potentially. Oh, making peace with... Oh, okay. I'm actually happy to do this. I'm actually very happy to do this, mainly because I've been seeing a lot of messages that have been telling me that Sturgeons have indeed been captured by Batanian forces. And as a result, we have a significantly reduced force on the world map. And so having some of those people be released is definitely going to help us in the long run. Oh yeah, I should also probably uh, show you exactly what's going on, by the way, because as you can no doubt see, the Azerai, the Western Empire, and the Northern Empire all made peace with us. And obviously you've just seen the Batanians make peace as well. So that's 9,420 dinars every single day in tribute, which is crazy because we're already gaining a positive amount of uh, money every single week, just uh, every single day, should I say, thanks to these tributes right here. And otherwise, we have the Kuzate, who are actually maybe getting down. Look at that, they're getting down in combat strength. It's actually amusing how these factions, even with their significantly reduced combat strengths, are all putting up a pretty significant fight as it is. And you wouldn't think so, considering the Sturgeons, theoretically, have 21,000 combat strength, but they don't seem to be able to show it, which is really weird in my opinion. I, I really don't know why that is happening, but oh well, can't really do much about it, can I? So I guess we're just going to build our trebuchets. I actually, you know what? You know what? I'm actually not going to build trebuchets. I'm going to build some siege towers and things like that instead. I was hoping that I'd be able to call some more people that might indeed have some engineering skill but that doesn't seem to be the case anyway we're actually going to be attacking this guy by the looks of things change of plans yeah things happen very very fast and we are going to need to make a decision here is this guy actually the leader he is mm, interesting interesting i might be able to get him or at the ver ah yes wait a minute he's in an army i i still okay so now here's the thing I understand that persuasion was very powerful and everything, but what I don't understand is us not being able to speak to him while he's in an army, because it's hard enough, in my opinion at least, to persuade vassals in the first place with the amount of changes that have been made recently to persuasion and to the charm skill. Um, it, it just makes it very difficult to make any inroads whatsoever, especially if you don't have everything has a price. If you don't have that and you have no trade skill whatsoever, then I can only uh, hope that some higher power comes and helps you because that's probably what is going to be required to get anyone to join you in that case. Because otherwise, and it, unless you have a massive amount of cash, and it is possible to make a lot of cash very, very quickly. I mean, you can obviously use smithing if you want to. You can um, do like I'm doing and basically just sell as much loot as you can get your hands on. And uh, to be fair, I've only made... Um, I, 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 mm, I'm not entirely sure on the numbers here. Uh, so it's probably not a good idea for me to try and... Uh, say uh, accurately that you know any kind of uh, value to you know to the particular method but basically selling any of this loot has given me probably 20 times maybe even 30 times maybe even 40 times the amount that smithing has given me in this entire playthrough which it, it, that's that's pretty you know that's pretty significant because as far as I'm aware, at least as far as I remember, from us using smithing, we basically gained about maybe like four hundred thousand, maybe like four hundred thousand or something like that. And yeah, it is very powerful to get that early on in the game. But if you think about how much money I have right now, that's literally just due to random stuff. That's just due to, to loot and, uh, and and to fiefs and, uh, you know, various other things. It's not actually due to anything I'm doing with, with smithing at all. So generally, I would say that, uh, you know, once you're in this position, nothing is going to stop you from gaining cash. Because as long as you have a good amount of towns and castles and so on, there's really not much the game can do to really penalize you at all. 
And I know a lot of people actually did tell me over the various series, by the way, that, and uh, I think there was a, a recent comment on it as well. Uh, maybe? Mm, not entirely sure on that, but the amount of money that is being made is um, quite relative to how it actually was back in actual history. So it's good to know. It's good to hear from uh, people that might be more fluent with that um, with that kind of subject matter than I am, because let's face it, I am far and away not a history expert in any way, shape or form. I have never said that I am, uh, but yes, anyway, point is, it's it's a very cool thing to know that that is indeed the case, and people were running around with millions. I mean, you know, relative to that particular time, because obviously back then, a thousand, yeah, uh, let, let's take um, UK currency as a, as a way to, you know, give an example. So let's say a thousand pounds or something like that was probably literally like, what, 10 million or something, I don't know. But it was gonna be a very significant amount indeed. Anyway, there we go, yes, she's the last one. She was the last one of her clan and now all of them have been eliminated. That is nice to see. All right, so let me actually just have a look at her clan, who, who they were. Okay, yeah, De Valant, that is indeed Cervic and his clan. So that's good to know. Very, very good to know indeed. And they have now been eliminated, so they will no longer be a thorn in our side. Thank you very much. So let us now make our way back. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Seems like we are indeed being interrupted once again. This is generally the reason why I do not appreciate fighting the Kuzate. They always seem to come up with something else. There always seems to be some additional little irritant that comes out of nowhere and is like, hello there, I have come to ruin your day. And that's exactly what they do tend to do quite often. But anyway, um, someone actually did have a pretty cool suggestion and definitely uh, something that I'll consider in the future. Basically, you said something along the lines of, why don't you just eliminate the Kuzate first and see what other factions rise to power instead of them? I think that's actually a really cool idea. And you know what I'd actually like to see along those lines? I'd like to see maybe a mod or maybe a setting that allows you to disable or indeed enable certain factions in certain areas. So for example, you know where the Kuzate are at the moment. I'd love to see a setting potentially added to the base game or maybe a mod or something like that. I don't know. I, I'm not really caring where it comes from. I just really like the functionality or maybe the idea of it potentially. But anyway, I'd like to see the option to disable a particular faction and give that territory to someone else. So for example, if we were to um, have like a, cu a completely custom game, let's say that we wanted to literally go, I mean, I think there are a couple of mods that do this already, by the way. So, you know, uh, you, you don't need to comment that unless you have, uh, you know, something uh, particularly cool to uh, to let me know about. Then I'm I'm all for it. I'd love to hear about those. They're very very cool uh, to me. I like that kind of subject matter. But anyway, point is, I'd love to be able to remove the Kuzate entirely and just give their towns to other other factions. So, for example, if we wanted to make like a showdown kind of thing, then what we could do is we could have Vlandia on the left side, and we could have the whoever on the right side. And I, I, don't, I don't know who it could be. It could be anyone. It could be any of the empires. It could be the Azurai. It could be whoever it is. And then everyone would fight over all of the other towns. So they could basically just have the original towns right here. They could just have their original towns and then all of the other towns would be captured by bandits or random neutral forces. And then whoever can capture the most territory the fastest and then indeed clash in the center, that would actually be a pretty cool, pretty cool plot line for a mod setting or indeed just for a custom game of some sort. I think that would actually be super fun. But maybe that's just me. Maybe you won't find that fun. But who knows? Maybe you'll find something else fun. You know, there are a whole bunch of possibilities coming out with the addition of more modding tools. And the developers are obviously working very, very hard to get all of that implemented as fast as they possibly can. And uh, indeed, I haven't uh, I haven't actually checked BannerlordPerks.com recently, but that is definitely going to be something that I will indeed be checking out uh, quite soon. 
as I would like to uh, see what's happening with the uh, the various perks and things. All right, so it is snowing down something fierce right here, and uh, well, hopefully that's actually gonna give us a little bit of an advantage in comparison to the opponent, because of course, the archers, I think, will probably have a little bit of a penalty to their ranged attack at the moment, or at least to their ranged accuracy. I can hope that that will be the case. As you can see, however, most of my forces are being absolutely idiotic right now, and they are not using their shields. Can I tell them to use their shields? Yet they're already in shield wall. Look at this. They are already in shield wall. Is there anything else I can do? It doesn't look like it. Look at that. Yeah, I can't force them to use their shields. That is actually, a, in my opinion, a bit of an oversight. Yeah, I think that is indeed a bit of an oversight. Because as far as I'm aware, back in Warband, you could force your units to use one-handed or use two-handed weapons. And um, I would love to be able to force them to use their one handeds right now because them using no shield is just opening them up to all kinds of attack. And that is not good whatsoever. That is really, really bad. Hopefully we'll be able to take Van Overpol though. I did not want to really wait outside the walls for too much time because of course that's just going to open us up to even more attacks. I'd love to be able to go up a siege tower again as well because I actually found that really, really fun. Instead of going through the main gate over there, it is a lot more nerve-wracking, I guess you could say, because you are completely swamped by the enemy as soon as you get up there. And that's exactly how you really want your defenders to be. Obviously, I don't want them to be like that as the attacker, but if you're in the defense... You definitely want those guys to be right up in the grill of your opponent. You want them to maximize the amount of area that they're covering. Uh, uh, okay. Well, they didn't really maximize the amount of area that they're covering, did they? Well, this is a bit problematic, isn't it? Okay, so I think I'm just going to fight up here real quick. And this guy is going to be dying soon, hopefully. Oh, hello there. Nice. Oh, I'll take out that Imperial Archer. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. So as I was saying in the uh, previous episode as well, by the way, this is the reason why this axe exists. These are the kinds of situations that it actually excels in because it is fast. It is damaging enough that it will be able to... Oh. Yes, damaging enough that it will be able to eliminate archers in not too many hits. Unfortunately, uh, this guy is proving to be very, very tricky indeed. Uh-huh. Ooh, take him out. That's what you get. Oh, yes, that is what you get. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just switch to my two-handed now. Oh, yeah, take him out. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, you're coming up? Oh, yeah, that was a mistake, sir. That was a mistake. Oh no, that's a thrown weapon. That is not good. <laughs> that is not good whatsoever. Yes, you don't want to be uh, you don't want to be using a thrown weapon in close quarters combat. Thank you. Oh dear. I have a bad feeling about this. Okay, I'm actually going to tell my forces to charge in here. My shield is Oh. <laughs> uh 100% 100% that was a death on my part. There was no way that I was going to survive here. Now, this is exactly the reason why, by the way, I feel like Siege Towers are super fun to play with in Bannerlord, because they've given you two. Now, obviously in Warband, if you didn't play Warband, then you obviously won't know this, but in Warband, there was only one. You could only have one. You could only go through one particular entry point, and it was absolutely monstrous. The amount of damage that you would sustain from such an attack would be so incredible that you'd basically do one siege and then be like, oh, okay, well, um, I guess I'm gonna, you know, recruit all my units again, basically, you know. Uh, uh, well, uh, dependent on your surgery skill, of course, or in, in Bannerlord, that's obviously known as medical skill, but you know, in Warband it's known as surgery, and that reduces the chances that your units will indeed die completely. And uh, the higher medicine skill you have, 
in Bannerlord is what actually determines that passively. So you don't even need to spec into it technically to be able to gain those things. You're just going to be gaining some traits and perks that will help you in other ways, which is always very nice. You know, that's not a bad, bad thing at all. But that seems to be it. And that is indeed a victory. Very nice. We've taken Van Overpool. And, uh, oh yeah, someone actually asked, uh, how, how am I making so much influence? Okay, here's the thing. I'm making so much influence because of my Bannerlord tweaks settings. And you can basically change your um, influence gain as much as you possibly want. Bear in mind that I'm also gaining influence from a variety of other sources. As you can see right here, there are policies that you can enact and uh, you can basically uh, also build things in your towns and in your castles and that can also award you a certain amount of influence. But if you're wondering how much I get or why I get so much from battles, that is due to Bannerlord tweaks and it's highly recommended to install that, at least in my opinion, because it makes the game just so much better with all of its quality of life improvements. And if you're indeed not making a YouTube series, uh, then you don't obviously have to play with that if you don't want to. I generally just play with that because it tends to speed things up a little bit. It just makes things a little bit more streamlined for the series itself. And I know a lot of people are very critical of all of the XP gain stuff and the influence gain and renown gain and all that stuff. But you got to remember that this is a series I have to produce every single day and it's not something that I would play in my off-screen time, um, in, in my spare time, which I don't really have that much of anyway. But the point is, in general, if I was playing this for leisure, I would be having a much more reduced amount of influence and renown and so on and so forth, because I wouldn't mind how long it would take because I wouldn't have to produce anything for entertainment and so on. It would just be entertaining to me. So that's obviously also coming round about once again to my point where, in my opinion, if you're having fun in the game, it doesn't matter what you're using. And I'm talking about mods, talking about settings, talking about anything. So you don't even have to play on realistic. You don't have to play on any of these difficulty settings because of peer pressure or because someone said, oh, I played on the highest difficulty and look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm amazing or whatever. Good for them. Uh, you know, if they want to play on the highest difficulty, uh, you know, I, I'm playing on the highest difficulty, but that's just literally because I don't think it's that difficult in comparison to Warband, because Warband, that was, that becomes kind of insane on the highest difficulties the campaign ai alone makes it a uh, rather uh, it's, it becomes rather a, f a frustrating grind and that's not something that i want to experience and it's probably not something that you want to experience either especially for a YouTube series because otherwise it's basically going to be hey you know that guy that we defeated five seconds ago oh he's he's back and he's got 150 Nord Huskals breathing down our neck yeah that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about in Warband at least but that doesn't seem to be the case in Bannerlord I feel like the Bannerlord um, difficulty settings have become much more balanced although do bear in mind that if you are a beginner to the game and you have you know, uh, I don't know, 10 hours in the game or something like that, and you're having difficulties playing on realistic, you know, just bump it down. Just, 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 just turn it down a little bit. Just, you know, play on, play on a lighter setting. You don't need to play on these higher settings right now. You can just focus on having fun. And isn't that what games are all about? It's about having fun. It's about forgetting about the world around you, just enjoying yourself to the max. And that's the kind of thing that I try to do as well, even though it is for a series, obviously. But generally, I do tend to try and maximize the amount of enjoyment that I get, and hopefully by proxy, the maximum maximize the amount of enjoyment that you get as well. But uh, yeah, anyway, you don't have to feel bad about playing on lower difficulties. I think that's just, I think that's re really silly to um, be, uh, uh, you know, pressuring other people to play on higher difficulties. I don't think that that really makes any difference, you know. Fun, fun is the, the name of the game, not whether it's difficult or easy or whatever. You know, it's fun, it needs to be fun. And we're now at Vladiv Castle. I'm just gonna auto resolve this very, very fast, but I just wanna touch again upon the whole fun thing. I realize that 
if you have fun playing on higher difficulties, then more power to you. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. I'm just saying that in general, however you find fun is maybe not how someone else will find fun. And so just just be uh, you know just be understanding about that. Who knows? Who knows what uh, what people are going through? Anyway, we are now going to hopefully be able to auto resolve this and uh, get Vladiv Castle back into. Ah, oh, you do you see? You see this, you see this absolute fool clown of a clan. Uh, they're just literally doing whatever at this point. Popilia, Popilia, I need to murder you immediately. I need to murder her very, very soon because uh, she is doing some very irritating stuff. And uh, if you didn't uh, see that, did you see the previous vote? I think you did see the previous vote. And I think Popilia was on there, wasn't she? Wasn't she on the, uh, the voting screen? I'm not entirely sure, but if she was, then that's really bad, because that means that she may have potentially been awarded Varnovapol if I hadn't voted myself, and as a result, then she would have taken it back to the Kuzate. She seems to be a bit of a faction hopper. At least, that particular clan as a whole seems to be a bit of a faction hopper, rather than just her uh, individually. I don't think that it's, it's her fault. I think it's probably just the doctrine of that particular that particular clan. But anyway, we're going to do an auto-resolve here. I'm going to lose a lot of units. That is to be expected, of course. Look at that. Huge amounts of casualties being lost right there. But bear in mind that I'm actually going to be able to restore all of those back on their feet, with the exception of the 60 that I lost. But that is, in my opinion, completely worth it to get this back under our control as soon as possible. Now, who's going to be awarded this? That's the thing that I want to find out in just a second. Oh, we're declaring war, but I, I'm going to, really? Even if I say no, it makes no difference? Look at that. Everyone wants to go to war against them. Okay, well, your funeral, Mr. Yorig, your funeral, you better not make a mistake here, sir. Otherwise, we're going to be, well, shall we say, I'm going to be taking care of your mess. You imbecile. I don't know why he's even doing that. Anyway, this is apparently going to Vipon. <sighs> Not a big fan of this particular decision, but where else is it going to go? Yorig? <laughs> the guy that just went for a nice war declaration against the Batanians? Even though technically the Sturgeons have every right to declare war against the Batanians because we do have such a significant combat strength. But... In my opinion, it would have been much better to leave the Batanians alone for the moment, leave the Vlandians alone, leave everyone else alone, and just literally focus on the Kuzate right now. That's what I would have done, because you can see here the Batanians have actually gained about a thousand combat strength since last we saw them, so that's pretty significant. The Kuzate are losing combat strength because obviously I'm doing a lot of the heavy lifting right now. And we have the Northern Empire, 3,200. Western Empire is basically done. The Azerai are probably our most dangerous enemy at this point, even though the Kuzeta are, for some reason, still having a lot of territory under their control. That is very strange to me. But otherwise, if you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like. It is greatly appreciated. Otherwise, I thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.